Good afternoon. On behalf of the AGU Global Environmental Change Focus Group, I'd like to welcome you and welcome you to Wednesday is GEC Day. And we're having special events for GEC Day uh, in the era of the new AGU. Uh, back in June, we had an AGU council meeting. And uh, after the formal session, we held a workshop to try to prioritize what the goals were for the uh, uh, AGU in the coming years. And uh, we conducted a straw poll. And it turned out that in this straw poll, the AGU council members uh, picked a new goal as our first priority. And the new goal is to equip the AGU members, our fellow scientists, to get the word out on climate change and global environmental change issues. And the number two goal was sort of an internal structural thing working on restructuring the AGU. Uh, but that gives us a new impetus. And so this is one of the first events of the new AGU. So on, uh, uh, part of the inspiration for this GEC day came from uh, Stephen Schneider's book, uh, Science as a Contact Sport. And uh, had he still been alive, he would have been one of our speakers today. Uh, but we now have a uh, Stephen Schneider Memorial Lecture, and uh, we will be having a panel discussion afterwards, which will include all of the 12 uh, speakers from this morning's session, as well as uh, Michael Oppenheimer. So uh, I will pass you on to um, Don Wobbles, who's the chairman of GEC, and welcome to GEC Day, and welcome to the new AGU. Good afternoon. Um, well, as as uh, Steve mentioned, our good friend and colleague, Steve Schneider, died suddenly this July, and he is greatly missed by, by us all. It is our honor today to have a special lecture in his name. Steve was the M Melvin and Joan Lane Professor for Interdisciplinary Environmental Studies at Stanford University. Beyond his many contributions as an educator, he was a great scientist, a great communicator, and just one of the most wonderful human beings I've ever met. A man of unbound energy and infectious enth enthusiasm. As a scientist, Steve made enormous contributions to the study of our climate system and to the concerns about climate change these include a variety of studies in numerical modeling of the Earth climate system and the role of particles and clouds. To quote uh, another f colleague and, and friend of ours, Ben Sanner, Ben said that some climate scientists have exceptional talents in pure research. They love to figure out the inner workings of the climate systems. Others have strengths in communicating complex scientific issues to non-specialists. It is rare to find scientists who combine these talents. Steve Schneider was su just such a man. Steve had rare gifts of being able to explain the complexities of climate science in plain English. He could always find the right story, the right metaphor, the right way of distilling difficult ideas and concepts down to the essence. Steve Schneider also epitomized scientific courage, as well as personal courage. He was fearless. The pathways he chose to be a scientific leader, to be a leader in science communications and to fully embrace the interdisciplinary nature of the climate change problem was not an easy pathway. Yet without the courage of leaders like Steve Schneider, the world would not be on the threshold of agreeing to radically change the way we use energy. At least we hope it's on that threshold. <laughs> Michael Oppenheimer, our guest speaker today, is another such person who's, who's done much to make a difference. Michael is the Albert G. Milbank Professor of Geosciences and International Affairs at Princeton University. He is also the director of the program in science, technology, and environmental policy, called STEP, at Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School. He joined Princeton in, in 2002 after more than two decades with the Environmental Defense Fund, where he was chief scientist and manager of the climate and air programs. Michael is a longtime participant in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and 
like many of us, um, has his own little piece of the Nobel Peace Prize from 2007. And he served most recently as a lead author of the IPCC's fourth assessment report and is now a coordinating lead author on a special report on uh, ex climate extremes and disasters, as well as being a CLA on IPCC's fifth assessment. Michael's research interests include science and policy of the atmosphere, particularly climate change and its impacts. Much of his research aims to understand the potential for dangerous outcomes of increasing levels of greenhouse gases by exploring the effects of global warming on ecosystems such as coral reefs, on the ice sheets, and on sea level, and on patterns of human migration. Michael is the author of more than 100 articles published in professional journals and the co-author of a book called Dead Heat, The Race Against the Greenhouse Effect. His talk today brings all that together by him speaking on scientist, expert judgment, and public policy. What is our proper role? Michael. Do I advance the slides? How do I advance the slide? Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Don and Steve. Um, I, sh I certainly feel particularly honored um, to be here today. Let me see if I can get the slides right. Yes, okay. Uh, to deliver the first Stephen Schneider lecture. Steve was a friend and a colleague and an inspiration and um, who spoke eloquently and convincingly about questions with which I have struggled my entire career and which I'm going to address today. What is a useful and proper role for scientists in the public arena? How can we best discriminate where the boundary lies between expert knowledge and values or political opinion? And how can we properly honor that line? What can we expect in the way of a reception for our interventions in the public arena? And how can we increase their efficacy? At the same time, I'm a little bit sheepish about delivering um, this speech uh, because I'm sure some of my recommendations are going to sound like Polonius's to thine own self be true. They're that obvious and trite. Uh, on the other hand, they are my experience. Uh, they're not a scholarly analysis of what goes on in the public arena. Uh, they do come out of uh, 30 ideas of, as a practitioner. And uh, I hope it's of some use to you. Finally, I'm sure at some point or another in my career, I violated the very recommendations that I'm going to give to you today. None of us are perfect. So um, let me give you the roadmap to the talk. The talk is structured as follows. First, I'm going to raise three questions which might be asked of any of us who are skeptical about scientists becoming involved in the public arena, which I'm sure some of you are. I hope my answers convince any of the skeptics in the crowd that it's a sensible thing to do and to some degree these days inevitable, can't be avoided. A second, noting that such involvement doesn't mean all of us has to aspire to be a Carl Sagan or a Steve Schneider or a Jim Hansen, I'll propose a couple of broad principles and five potential different ways in which you can become involved in the public arena, each quite distinct, and I'll give you some advice about how to navigate each. Third, I th I'll strike some cautionary notes, emphasizing the difficulties you'll encounter if you go public. Um, and I want to emphasize that although some of that might sound like discouraging, my overall uh, feel about it is it's, you know, I've had a great ride spending a lot of my career trying to do things constructively in the public and policy arena and I would encourage as many of you as have the inclination to do it to go ahead and get involved. And by way of wrapping up, I'm going to try to channel some advice more or less directly from Steve himself. But let me begin by providing a scholarly context for this. I've been in academia now again for nine years and it's affected my brain. So I don't feel I can launch directly into a, uh, an anecdotal presentation on, any, on anything. So I'm going to give you some context for understanding Steve's philosophy of how scientists could, should, and actually do engage in the public arena. There's, uh, there is, in fact, a substantial literature on these questions going back to at least to C.P. Snow and probably much earlier. And um, 
more recently including the views of Naomi Oreskes, who I'd written into this speech before I saw she was here, uh, Sheila Jasanoff, Roger Pilkey Jr., and a whole list of others. Uh, the dilemma highlighted by C.P. Snow provides both a convenient jumping off point for this lecture and also a useful way to understand why Steve Schneider's views were so central to our current concerns. So let me remind you of Snow's argument, since many of you may actually never have heard of him. Um, I remember Al Gore mentioned him in a lecture here uh, three years ago, and I asked some of my friends afterwards if they remembered C.P. Snow and the two cultures, and most of them had no idea what Al was talking about, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, the, um, and and the, what's intervened is last year was the 50th anniversary of the famous lecture, and uh, there were articles all over the place, including a big takeout of it in Nature, so maybe some of you are up to speed by now. So why dredge up C.P. Snow's argument again? Partly because his statement of the science society communications problem was so clear, but also because in a broad sense, the key challenges for the human endeavor on which he believed science should focus, and which Steve thought science should focus, remain unresolved, have grown even more complex, and were also, as I said, at the center of Steve's, very, uh, Steve's professional career. Furthermore, and in hindsight, Snow's proposed solutions to the communications problem were not sufficient to overcome the complexity of the communications terrain, particularly not the way it is today, and how to navigate this terrain is, after all, the main subject of my talk. So that's why I'm focusing on Snow. In the two cultures, Snow, who was a physicist and novelist, issued a diatribe against Britain's educated elite of the 1950s, which foreshadows with remarkable prescience today's perceived crisis in the public's supposed lack of understanding of science and the potential consequences of this shortfall, particularly in deba debates over the environment and global warming. Peel away the class critique that's embodied in the two cultures and a deep fear over the incapacity of people to comprehend and of governments to tackle the key issues of global resources and global equity is revealed. And that's broadly the same debate we're in the midst of now and in which Steve was so engaged. This pessimism on Snow's part sits side by side with his optimism about the technological possibilities for fixing these problems if only science were mobilized and heated, heated and mobilized, I should say. So Snow identified the key problem but misjudged the solution by failing to anticipate the complexity of the current world. Snow based his analysis on a juxtaposition which is no longer valid, the culture of physics providing one model of influential thought and highbrow culture providing the other, if anybody remembers what highbrow culture is. Today, today the physics model for scientists, which I'm going to for scientific progress, which I'll cartoon here, um, describing everything imaginable, uh, neat laws, describing everything imaginable, deduced by geniuses, verified or falsified by experiments, seems relevant to a smaller and smaller set of public issues. Gradually, the model is being replaced by the more complex and uncertain way of thought characteristic of problems in geosciences or biology or environment. In these arenas, Facts and values are sometimes harder to separate than in the physics problems. And so it's not coincidental that these fields generate many of today's p political conflicts as well. Furthermore, um, culture among the influential is no longer particularly highbrow, if it ever was. So generalist versus expert is probably a better description of the current dichotomy. The quandary is this, how can a society of generalists govern itself when most of the issues of the day are highly technical. Many solutions to this conundrum have been proposed by scientists for many years, and by others, too. One is Snow's idea of merging the scientific and popular cultures through improved education. Another is a public policy technocracy dominated by scientific elites. In some ways, it's a model similar to the way the French government runs. Of course, these proposals cover only half the existing spectrum of opinion. Some people of faith might argue that science's role in people's education and public decisions ought to be entirely secondary. But I'll go back to the first half of the spectrum now. Specifically, Snow argued that the scientific revolution was the last phase of the industrial revolution, and he saw the industrial revolution as a mixed bag. It brought general 
but of general improvement but widespread disparities. Snow's argument anticip anticipated quite specifically the rise of China, the shifting of economic balance among nations, and the importance of the global implications of seemingly local problems, in his, in his case not global warming, but the population problem. He imagined science integrated into education and politics as the font of all solutions. And he saw scientists as wiser, more reliably ethical, and more inclined to an optimistic and activist view of human possibilities than were others. You can make your own judgment on that statement, knowing yourselves. What Snow could not have appreciated is the limitations of science in the face of the complexity of the problems he had highlighted and the resulting existence of a contested zone where values, judgment, and science fight it out for controlling influence over policy decisions. He also seemed blind to the limited ability of scientists to explain their own work so that their role in public education was in fact highly problematic and very difficult to implement. Some scientists are fearful of treading in the contested terrain at all, while others do so but experience great difficulty in distinguishing its boundaries and separating expert knowledge from value-laden subjective judgments. These fears and difficulties should not be surprising. Many scientists loathe ambiguity as a permanent state because it's their job, our job, to resolve it. Inability to do so is seen by us as either failure or that we're dealing with substance that's just beyond our expertise and where we have no business treading. Scientists like to deal with problems by draining them of values and ambiguity, isolating the facts, and, and, um, and I think this accounts for the limitations of Snow's views. Politics and policy must inevitably reinsert these complexities. Scientists are in their hearts control freaks. I'm speaking for myself there. But, um, <laughs> But control is simply not possible to exert over these types of problems. The human complexity of dealing with these issues, which Snow overlooked, was Steve Schneider's favorite playground. In other words, you could look at Steve as a C.P. Snow for the postmodern world. I'll, rest I'll return to Steve's views at the end of my talk after outlining the conundrum scientists face in considering involvement in the public arena. First, by addressing why participation in the public arena can't easily be avoided. Next, by suggesting some ideas based on my own experiences, which may help you formulate your own guidelines so that you can better calibrate your own participation. Involvement in the public debate, in the debate over public policy, is common for scientists in, and accepted, broadly accepted, in many disciplines. In scientists, sciences related to public health, it's taken for granted that experts will talk loudly in public about the implications of their research for public policy, whether in regard to smoking or diet or HIV. There's also a remarkable track record of geoscientists like you folks taking a lead role in the public arena and actually affecting public policy, as far as we can tell, in directions that many of us are grateful for. Sherry Rowland's very public role on ozone depletion stands out, as do the contributions of Jim Hansen, Steve Schneider, Bob Watson, on, uh, and others on climate. In other arenas, one could point to Hans Bade and Henry Kendall at one end of the belief spectrum, or Edward Teller at the other end. Some of these people mostly translated science for the wider public, Others endorsed specific policy initiatives. I agree with the views of many of these scientists, and I strongly disagree with the views of other ones. One, not, one cannot prove that the world followed a better or even a different path due to their interventions, but I think the quality of public discourse and the information reaching policymakers was better for their interventions taken as a whole. Despite these examples, our colleague Jim Hansen has asserted that by and large, members of our community are reticent, that's his word, hesitant to speak out about the implications of their research, and when they do, they take a cautious approach in evaluating or making judgments and enunciating them. By and large, I agree, I think he's probably right, and I, I'd like to see, um, I'd like to see what page I'm on, okay. I'd like to see more of my colleagues have more to say, because I think that they, you, have a lot to offer. But it's not easy to do so in a satisfying way. The messages are easily misunderstood. Our interventions are sometimes unhinged from our expertise in a way that is not helpful to the listener. After all, some, sometimes uh, reticence is the right choice to make. And also, it's not clear when, who, or if anyone is listening to us. 
Finally, I assume this audience holds a spectrum of views on any particular aspect of, the, of, the, of any scientific problem like global warming, which is characterized by larger uncertainty. And you, may, you probably know my views on the problem, but even if you disagree with me on those views, you should stick around if you want to engage in the public arena. I might have some things to say to you that are useful. Um, still, a scientist who doubts the necessity of such involvement might ask the following questions. Yes, that's it. Okay. Public involvement takes time. Can't I just stay in my office or lab while policymakers and the public wrestle over what to do about the various scientific and technologically related issues that we're dealing with today? Uh, alas, I'm afraid this is, not, this is uh, increasingly difficult to do, and if followed by the community as a whole, would be highly irresponsible. Science is not wholly owned by the governments or gov government or governments, but it does draw a large fraction of its support from the public. Um, I'll return to the question later of individual ethical obligation, but for now, let me say that this financial support to me means that Science as an enterprise <clears throat> on the whole, the community, if not individual scientists, owe something in return. The least we can do is be available to interpret our research findings and, if possible, explain their implications for society. But there's also a pragmatic reason to get involved. If we don't, we leave Congress, for example, with the option of seeking explanation from those less competent to offer these up. Alternatively, we can be proactive about it and define the meaning and significance of our own work rather than let others do it for us. If the world were this way, there it is, science, scientists just deliver their little neat packages to the public and to government and then out pops laws and regulations, then it might be make sense to just abstain from the policy world. You, you know, we wouldn't be needed. But of course, life is much more complex than that. I like to use that figure. And you can, scientists are situated, I actually should have put them in the middle, in the middle of this chaos where everything affects everything else and it's just not possible to escape. Even if we could make clear and direct explanations of our work, absent ambiguity, yet honoring all our beloved caveats, Interaction with the public is a dialogue, not a monologue. Even the cleanest scientific statements demand elaboration once the inevitable follow-up questions begin to roll in. Let me provide an example in the form of a famous statement in IPCC's fourth assessment report, a statement renowned and highlighted in the report for its clarity and simplicity. Quote, warming of the climate system is unequivocal. What precisely about warming is unequivocal? That it has been occurring in the past? That it will occur in the future? That the entire problem we call global warming is unequivocal in all aspects? These are all questions that a reasonably intelligent person could raise when reading such a statement, unless they also absorb the minutia of explanations and modifications which accompanied that statement in the report. In fact, the UN climate negotiators just last week tripped on this very issue when they wrongly asserted that the statement meant that not only the fact that Earth had warmed, but the attribution of this warming to human activity were both unequivocal. And IPCC didn't mean that. So we simply cannot just drop our pearls of wisdom and expect others to deconstruct them. That much is our job, it's our responsibility. Every time we emphasize or de-emphasize a point, assign livelihood to an outcome or refrain from doing so, we are exercising expert judgment about what is important and what is not. Similarly, every time we say an outcome may happen rather than may not happen, or that its opposite may or may not occur, we're making such judgments. And those judgments are partly subjective because in many cases, a different expert might justifiably have, have a different view and express his view or her view differently. Uncertainty, which these problems are characterized by, massive uncertainty, goes hand in hand with subjective judgments and with the necessity of making those judgments. For, for an entertaining example of this, I urge you to, um, ha, ha, any of you seen the movie Fair Game? There's a great scene in there in which um, former uh, vice presidential aide Scooter Libby explains to a CIA analyst why, the, why words like maybe and maybe not matter in making expert judgments in a different subject area, of course. So 
we're stuck in a certain framework. We just can't, you know, write down simple statements and disappear from the room. So third question. Okay, I'll acknowledge that a scientist might ask, I'll acknowledge that somebody else, somebody has to do the dirty work, but I'm not so good at communication, so I'd prefer to let everyone else take this on and leave me alone. Wrong again. Ask some of your colleagues who never tried to be public figures or never said anything even mildly controversial, but who nevertheless became collateral damage in the so-called climate gate, the CRU email affair. Just because they were recipients of mostly anodyne emails sent to them by others, and in many cases, they didn't even respond. To be blunt, science and scientists are now part of an unavoidable and contentious public discussion. This is no longer 1983 when the National Academy of Sciences could issue a monumental report on climate change and have it go largely unnoticed except by the cognoscente. Climate and related issues are characterized by very high socioeconomic stakes. That's the main reason why so much research money relatively is spent on them and why they generate so much public controversy. That's life as it is and as it, will, as it will be for the foreseeable future. We as a community and as individuals can either try to frame that discussion and be prepared for involvement or let others who are less interested in scientific truths set the terms of discussion for us. I'm encouraged that institutions like AGU are eager to do more to defend and explain science and are puzzling over and are experimenting with approaches for doing so. But it's not the institutions per se that carry the weight. In the end, it's up to the individuals who constitute those institutions, you and me. Fourth question, am I obliged to get involved? I mentioned um, community obligation before. As I already noted, I'm sure the community as a whole has an obligation to society to be informative about the meaning and implications of its research findings, assuming society wants to hear the information. I'm confident in this view because I understand that the public through its taxes pays for and supports a large portion of our research, including many of our salaries. Surely there is some obligation in return that goes beyond merely working away in our offices or laboratories. I feel strongly that the obligation on the community as a whole is implicit. But what about our individual obligations? Any involvement is a trade-off. It means lost research time. There's a credible argument that the world is better off with most of us just doing research and foregoing involvement in the public arena. Still, we can't all be free riders or our community would fall down on its overall obligation. For me, and this is my personal view, it's enough that people through their leaders, through the media, through individual requests want the information, I'm happy to provide it. And if they want my judgment on what to do about these problems, then I'll provide that too and try to be clear about which is which. In the end, each of us has to decide for him or herself, however. But there are two related and, and somewhat less contentious aspects of this obligation at which our community is failing miserably, in my view. First, we do little, if anything, to advise young scientists on the social and ethical context of the world in which, to which they are about to enter. What are the implications of their research for other human beings? What constitutes honest representation of their research beyond the usual rules of professional peer review and publication? How might others use their research? And how should they think about that transaction of producing information that others might use badly? NSF now requires instruction in research ethics, but that only scratches the surface. Are there any major univer research universities that require graduate students in our specific fields to take courses which would give them a complete framework for thinking about the obligations I've just listed? Or the public context in which their scientific views will be received, interpreted, and utilized? I don't know of any such program. If you know, please let me know. Our second failure is the inadequacy of the response to the threats to individuals in our community. Our professional societies respond vigorously to the to threat to the community as a whole as when the federal research budget is reduced. But these um, societies have great difficulty, have had great difficulty figuring out how to address such attacks on individuals or whether they have a role to play at all. This, but this is the sort of inverse free rider problem. The individual lamb can be sliced off from the group and devoured, and the group can ignore it, but eventually the whole herd is cut to shreds. 
AGU, National Academy of Sciences, AAAS, and the rest of our professional organizations need to learn how to differentiate reasonable complaints from the outside, which call for some sort of due process approach, as in the Himalayan glacier, glacier episode, and that can actually strengthen our enterprise from unreasonable, unfair, and abusive attacks, which have met with silence, as they too often were, threatened to undermine the independence of science and do great damage to individuals, as has already happened more than once. I hope I've convinced you that participation in the public arena is both desirable and to some extent unavoidable. If so, what are your options for involvement? What are sensible guidelines for behavior in this arena? Let me provide some suggestions based on my own experiences and remembering that the taste for, aptitude for, and utility of public involvement varies widely from scientist to scientist. So let's consider a full range. We don't all have to do the same thing. Option one. You can, ver you can very publicly take sides, for instance, in an election based on what you see of the policy implications of your research. This is one end of the spectrum and many, many surprisingly large numbers of individuals have publicly and in some cases rather loudly supported individual candidates, including presidential candidates, based on their, you know, what the, uh, the scientists feel is an, uh, an errant opinion, an errant political opinion which diverges from what the science would in some sense dictate. Um, if such, if, well, I'll get back to that later. In a less noticed way, many scientists sign on to collective campaign endorsements. It's argued by some that there is a price to pay for such activity, but the only price I've seen is that it's likely to rule you out for a political appointment by one of the candidates if your candidate happens to lose. But if getting such a job is not your objective, then I wouldn't worry about it. But clearly this end of the spectrum is not to everyone's taste. It involves great exposure. But concern about this, this sort of positioning uh, comes from a different direction as well. That the visible participation by scientists, qua scientists, in the political process dilutes the credibility and independence of science itself. I don't know if we have any proof on this point either way. But I merely note that scientists have long taken partisan positions as individuals, and I know of absolutely no evidence that it's done any damage to the greater collective reputation of, of our discipline. <clears throat> On a much larger scale, as an example, Eisenhower's run for president, it was, it, during that run it was argued that it was problematic for the image of the military to get involved in the civilian side. It doesn't seem to have any, had any effect in that regard. A more recent example that I like is um, to think about former Senate Senator and Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist, um, was his running on his credentials as a doctor, which he essentially did, if you remember, was that problematic? I, I think not. What, but Frist came to a kind of a bad end politically. What, what did Frist in was when he departed from a sound expert judgment as a doctor and began to make implausible pronouncements uh, which he based on his credentials in the, in the, uh, by making a TV diagnosis of Terry Schiavo, if you remember the case. So it's that dichotomy. It's trying to put your scientific credentials out as a front for what was really a, a position that was political or ethical but had nothing to do with science. That, I think, is what did him in or is part of the problem. My ground, rule, my ground rule here is clear. If you're going to use scientific arguments as a rationale for taking partisan positions, make sure you aren't simply using your science as a cover for what are really political, not scientific judgments. In other words, make sure you feel comfortable in your scientific skin when you do so. Option two, taking a, down, a notch down from partisan involvement. You can take both sides, um, you can take sides publicly on the policy implications of your research, commenting on, the, on various policy proposals, including active lobbying for particular policy proposals by visiting your representative in Washington, writing letters to the editor, posting blogs, or just answering questions when the media ask you. Again, there's no reason not to participate in this way. Scientists do it all the time. The least controversial example in our community occurs when scientists testify in Capitol Hill in favor of the, their research funding budgets. There's surely a that's surely a political act based on scientific as well as other judgments and motivations. More controversial interventions, but also with a long pedigree, occur when scientists back particular initiatives related to their research findings. For example, 
uh, uh, Jim Hansen this morning talking about a carbon tax versus cap and trade or fuel economy standards. Some of those things seem would make sense to each of us and different ones make sense, but they're not really linearly connected to the, our scientific expertise. In my lifetime, it's been done by an Edward Teller or a Henry Kennel on nuclear arms or various biologists on stem cell research or Paul Ehrlich on family planning or Gene Likens on acid rain or dozens of people in this room on climate change. The public discourse is richer for these interventions, not poorer. But I also argue for caution here. My ground rule, and most decidedly Steve's, is this. The further from your own expertise you wander in making judgments about policy, the shakier ground you, you are standing on, and the more humility and caution is called for on your part. It's one thing to argue that within scientific uncertainty, warming of a given amount would cause a particular level of damage. But it's a value judgment, not a scientific one, to argue that emissions reductions which could avoid that damage are necessary. And it's far outside the expertise of most people in this room to assert that one type or another type of policy initiative is appropriate for getting there. I do not argue that one should avoid making such judgments of political or value judgments, but like Steve, I think it's, Steve would, if were he here, would have said, it's important to be clear in your own mind and to be clear with the public which sort of judgment you're making. We're all entitled to our value judgments, our personal risk assessments, and they should be a key factor in public policy, but we are not entitled to make value judgments or political or policy judgment in areas we are not experts, like politics or economics, and try to pass them off as following automatically from our scientific expertise. That's delusional or dishonest. I'd like to be able to say that we should stop speaking as experts when we venture into terrain where we feel uncomfortable as experts, but for some reason this approach has not worked very well. People walk over the line all the time. Uh, it's as if they don't see that line. Some of our colleagues seem unaware, and I'm sure I've done it one time or another, of where their expertise ends, and they haven't been willing to do the hard work necessary to extend their expertise enough to justify their positions. There's one measure of expertise, expertise which, though it's a conservative measure, is a reasonable guideline. Have you published in the field? I'm a trained atmospheric chemist, but I taught myself and have published peer-reviewed papers on glaciology, so I feel I can speak to reporters as an expert on the role of ice sheets and sea level rise, for instance. But this wasn't always the case. Fifteen years ago, I became concerned about the fate of the ice sheets. I wasn't an expert on the subject, so I generally avoided commenting on whether the ice sheets were stable or not. After all, if you're a heart specialist and someone asks your view on his kidney problem, should you answer the question or should you tell them to consult a kidney specialist? The reporters can't sue you, so the tendency is to just talk to the reporter anyway, of course. The media can be lazy about doing due diligence and selecting who to ask, but we shouldn't be lazy in deciding whether to answer. So I did my homework, spending an entire year reading everything I could get my hands on about Antarctica and Greenland, going back to the literature from IGY right up to the present, and eventually published a review paper on the subject. Then, I felt then, and only then, did I feel qualified to make some judgments publicly. But reporters are often rushed, and a scientist's ego sometimes forecloses the option of handing off a media, media, opportunity, media opportunity to a colleague. And you don't all have to go so far as I did as spending a year researching a problem. There's intermediate steps, obviously. Still, just because you publish in the peer-reviewed literature doesn't mean that you have a license to say whatever comes to mind on a subject, even when it's scientific, it has scientific aspects. If you know your view on a scientific point is anomalous or incomplete, say so. Half-truths and statements out of context are sometimes the worst form of public deception. Being asked to venture expert opinions is intoxicating, but you need to keep your head while doing it. If someone sticks a microphone in front of you, it's awfully hard to keep quiet, but sometimes that's the right thing to do. There's another way to handle the issue of boundaries. If you know you're passing the limits of your core expertise and you feel compelled to venture an opinion nevertheless, perhaps in order to paint a complete picture, then rely on what IPCC has said or what an NRC panel has said in addressing this issue. 
This problem always arises, for example, when experts in the physical climate try to add perspective by mentioning impacts, or when impacts experts are tempted to discuss the comparative benefits of emissions abatement and adaptation. You needn't keep mum or give such a pinched answer that it's useless to others. Instead, you can seek at least a modicum of comfort by relying on the scripts which assessments by these organizations have provided for our community. Even if it differs from your own personal view, at least these assessments have a logic and a pedigree behind them, which your non-expert non opinion does not. Likewise, we're not entitled to assert or imply special status to our value judgments because they relate indirectly to our area of expertise. If a doctor expressed a view on whether people subject to capital punishment via death by injection felt pain and suffering, we would tend to see this terrain as within their expertise. But surely none of us would hes hesitate to express a value judgment about capital punishment in front of a doctor due to the doctors holding such expertise, nor would we necessarily honor the doctor's judgment on whether capital punishment is ever justified. Likewise, we should not hesitate to express value judgments about matters bordering on our expertise, but neither should we expect others to accept our judgments as having any higher value than theirs does in those, in those cases. And we should not pretend our values are a necessary outcome of our expert understanding. Often they are not. Now, option one and two clearly involve some sort of advocacy, the, the partisanship and the sort of commenting on policy. But you can eschew, eschew advocacy altogether and still participate usefully. You can do, uh, you can participate, uh, you can do as IPCC does and avoid forwarding particular policy positions. Indeed, consider these, these other options, option three. You can simply talk to reporters, for instance, offer useful insights into what is the state of the science and what are the implications as far as you know them. But be aware of the point I made earlier. Emphasis embodies subtle judgment, and there's a wide range of opinion about climate change and other issues once we get down into the details. As more of us speak in public, there will be more public disagreements on some issues. For example, some of you believe that collapse of the meridional overturning circulation in the, in, uh, if the world undergoes a moderate warming is a serious risk, while others don't. Some of you think that the, think the case for ice sheet instability is strong. Um, wait a minute. Lost my... Strong is stronger. Others don't. IPCC has expressed views on this. Some of us accept IPCC's views in general, but not on particular details. While I'm deeply committed to the IPCC process, I certainly disagree on some important judgments, not just the way that they were communicated, but on the substance with regard to sea level rise, for example. Regardless of the claims of some of our colleagues, IPCC is not a monolith, and, and dominant views in our community are, community are not enforced on others. What is frowned upon is not a divergent view, but the refusal to accept evidence-based arguments, the dishonest search for a back door when the front door is blocked by overwhelming proof. So be prepared for public disagreement and welcome it, but also be prepared to call out the misuse of science or the stonewalling in face of evidence. And there is a price to pay in speaking with the media, even just to venture scientific judgments. You'll receive some nasty emails, and I'll read you some later, or worse, you will, to some extent, lose control of your time. Once you decide you're willing to speak with the media and your name appears in public, you'll be called on more and more. At some point, everyone needs to draw boundaries in order to get their day job done. But the media are fickle, and there will be times when you have something pertinent to say, and no one will ask you your opinion. You need to be psychologically ready for that, too. There are other complexities. Steve made a career of explaining how wrong the media can get a story, even when you say it clearly. But the flip side is also true. Few of us know how to deliver a scientific statement correctly, but in language that the average consumer of information can understand. Usually it can be done, but not always. If in doubt, I would choose correct over clear. But having to make such a choice is never comfortable. And if you're called out of the blue by the media, Think things through before you answer. There's absolutely no reason to believe that your first thought is your best thought. The smartest answer I ever gave a reporter was, I'll call you back. Option four, you can participate in IPCC, AGU, AAAS, or other such activities. There's safety in numbers, and also the opportunity to step back and facilitate the, inter the more direct intervention by other members of the community. 
This is a critical task for the community as a whole. The avenues are expanding, and if, we, if you feel more comfortable participating in this way, then that's the route you should take. And of course, there's always the fifth option. One can choose not to comment on science except to an academic audience, refuse to sit on an expert panel where your judgments can be widely disseminated, avoid talking to anyone else about controversial issues, or even refuse to comment on an applied aspect of your research. Alas, even then you're not safe, as a CRU email episode shows, these days to be immune from being dragged into the public arena, one has to avoid research in any area which might conceivably have an application in the real world and then unplug your whole system to boot. No matter which of the first four of these routes you choose, it's important to maintain perspective because participation isn't always very rewarding, often doesn't produce a tangible product, and doesn't automatically translate into any effective change in the political arena. All that scientists and si science and scientists can demand in our society is to set the stage for dealing or not dealing with a problem. After that, we have a citizen's right to express an opinion, and some citizens may think our opinions have special value due to our presumed understanding of the interface between science and policy, but other expertise, Nah, I'm losing track here. But other value judgments, expertise, but, but value judgments, politics, other expertise dominate the rest of the policy evaluation equation and action spectrum. So while we have a right to be annoyed and outraged if the science itself is distorted or lied about, we have no particular reason as scientists to throw a temper tantrum if the policy world isn't what we would want it to be. That's real life. Furthermore, when the general public holds science, while the general public holds scientists in relatively high regard, and I have to say there isn't much competition there, many are wary on the details. Amid the welter of a bad economy, unemployment, college tuition, illness, divorce, and who knows what else, along comes some expert, some self-declared expert, telling you, quote, I have a magic back box, and out pops the answer, and it says if you don't do X, Y, or Z, the world comes to an end. You know, think about it. The automatic re reaction is to disbelieve and wrangle at such expert command authority. When a car mechanic or a widget maker or a doctor offers a judgment, we demand explanations. Why should scientists seek a special immunity due to their expertise? We are not a priesthood. We are fallible. We're just a contributor, albeit an important one, to a larger public debate. Based on these general points, here are some specific suggestions for using your time efficiently and effectively while keeping your expectations aligned with potential outcomes. One, think about your audience in advance and be ready for people not to listen to you and not to hear your message. Different audiences are receptive to different aspects of what you want to say. So always know whom you are speaking with and what your objective is. In particular, scientific arguments won't always work, even one-to-one. -one. Receptive, receptiveness to expertise is selective, preconditioned by listeners' views on a constellation of subjects. Not surprisingly, recent research, and I've done my work and asked other experts their opinion. This is not my opinion. Not surprisingly, recent research in social psychology, political science, and public opinion and I'll note in particular the work of Skip Lupia at Michigan, John Krosnick at, at Yale, at Stanford, Tony Lacerowitz at Yale, indicates that the average citizen has limited interest or time for delving into technical subjects, be they healthcare reform or nuclear arms control or global warming. Rather, they often look to the views of surrogate experts or opinion leaders who presumably have enough resources to evaluate and assess the relevant information and make informed judgments. But there are lots of potential surrogates on an issue like climate change, and people will often pick the one who aligns generally with their worldview. Al Gore provides a noteworthy example. He did his homework, and he had access to a big megaphone, so many people's views on global warming were influenced by his, particularly those on the so-called progressive side of the political center. If he moved the meter, however, with people on the so-called right, it may have been uh, overall to have reinforced their skepticism because he isn't their guy, because they were attuned to other surrogates. Various biases of this sort operate from both ends of the political spectrum and shape the uptake of technical information. In other words, 
With many people, science is part of a worldview, is part of a worldview view woven from many components. Discordant threads aren't easily accommodated. Often, they are simply removed. But the situation is not hopeless by any means. I'm a so-called progressive on the political spectrum, but I've convinced more than a handful of very accomplished, smart, conservative, wealthy individuals to accept the scientific consensus on climate change. I did this by sticking to the science and not giving them political or moral lectures. In fact, many of their political and moral principles are 180 degrees opposite mine, but they happen to be interested in the environment or in conservation. Particularly if you feel you're on a moral crusade, you may feel such people are not your target audience, and that's fine. But if they are, you might consider putting aside the moral principles while you serve up the science. It is sometimes possible to accept the latter, the science, without agreeing on the former, the, the values and the principles, the, and moral principles. We don't, all share, we don't all share the same values, and it might be more difficult to shift a person on both fact and value at once. One of our problems today is that people only chat about subjects like this with people they already expect to believe them. Very possibly, you will make the biggest difference by speaking with others whom you now have a fundamentally different worldview. If you disagree, if you disagree for instance, with the Wall Street Journal editorial page representation of science, then take the opportunity when you're in the same space as someone who probably reads those editorials to engage them, even if you think their general political views are vastly different from yours. Make them doubt their view of the science. Don't hide yours. In other words, cocktail parties could be more important places for education than universities. Second um, general caution, no matter how partisan and scientific is your intervention, expect to be vilified, but never return the favor. He, uh, here are some excerpts from emails I received after recent TV or radio interviews. They're not the worst I've heard from other people. I've tr I'm treated relatively well. For example, some of our colleagues have received direct threats, which I have not. But I hope these do ho serve to inoculate you a little bit should you decide to venture out into the public arena. This is a quote. Uh, first of all, I must say you look like Bozo the Clown. And <laughs> that was followed up with a vulgar reference to my mustache, which I decided not to repeat. Uh, a second one, quote, I suppose most of us can expect, can't expect much from, and then a vulgar reference to my inferred ethnic background, like you, except that you are so ex expletive ugly. And then a third email uh, bar, uh, with the subject line, commie maggot, just said, commie maggot, die slow, die hard. And those are the nice ones. Um, among, among the other risks you encounter for going public is that you will be accused of misconduct and even subject to legal in inquiry. Not that you will, but you may. Uh, since Michael Mann, a victim of such attacks, is speaking tomorrow, I'll leave this subject largely to him. But I want to note, as I alluded to before, that keeping your head low is no longer a guarantee of safety. For example, many of the, as many of uh, you know, earlier this year, Senator James Inhofe, acting as minority leader of the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, published a list of 17 scientists who were, quote, key players in the, quote, CRU controversy, and who, quote, violated fundamental ethical principles governing taxpayer-funded, and in some cases may have violated, taxpayer-funded research, and in some cases my, may have violated federal law, unquote, and then warning about further investigation and potential recommendation to the Justice Department. The apparent criteria for winning a spot on the list of 17 is that you have been involved in IPCC and also received one of the thousands of stolen CRU emails, even if you didn't answer them. The list includes several scientists who are not known for making public pronouncements at all, some of whom are an American and may never have been here for all I know, and others who are beyond reproach, like our colleague Susan Solomon. So there's no use being intimidated and hiding rather than speaking your expert mind if you really want to do so. Ultimately, uh, so-called good behavior may reduce your exposure, but won't completely remove your vulnerability to the hazard. Three, don't hide your bias. Think, think them over in advance before you open your mouth and lay them out. Um, we all have them, explicit and implicit, biases that is. I worked for an advocacy organization, EDF, for 21 years, and I'm still consulted by them for scientific advice. 
This relationship, like other consulting, brings along the possibility of conflict of interest, which, uh, when I make my judgments or express my views on certain subjects, it's hard to separate my judgments about policy matters from this relationship. I try, and I try hard, and I think I succeed. But I owe the listener the information so that they can weigh the importance. Accor accordingly, it's listed on my CV, in my bio, in my web page, et cetera, and I suggest you take similar measures. But there are other biases, subjective ones, harder to identify and articulate. I discussed these a few minutes ago. There's no good answer for how to deal with these except to be aware of the difference between fact and value judgments, to try to listen to yourself when you speak and hear yourself as someone with a different, differing worldview might hear you. Years ago, I asked one colleague why he thought climate sensitivity was almost certainly closer to one and a half degrees than three or four or five degrees, as the National Academy then had it. Rather than giving me a physical, a physical evidence in response, he said he just didn't believe that humans could affect the climate that strongly. That's fine, but it's a belief that should be stated as, as the out, at the outset and not hidden in the weeds. Uh, my fourth piece of advice is to keep it civil and don't let our differences ruin our sense of collegiality. I personally admit to having goofed several times in my public utterances over the many years, and I tried to learn from each mistake. A long time ago, after having briefed a high White House official in a er much earlier administration um, on the subject of ozone depletion, I described him on, after the briefing to a reporter as quote-unquote semi-ignorant because he made a naive comment to me belittling the importance of ozone depletion. When my remark was published in a major newspaper, an opportunity to further educate this influential leader had been lost to me, and I regret it to this day. I once got in a figurative food fight on TV with a colleague. We were attacking each other rather than each other's scientific assertions, and you could hear the remote controls clicking the channel to another channel all over the country. On, it was national TV. And again, you know, I lost an educational opportunity by using that tactic. So, five minutes? Okay. Science should be on the record, but ad hominem attacks are counterproductive and are almost always out of order. The worst outcome would be to sacrifice our norms, our sci norms as scientists due to the pressure. Pressure not just from our enemies to keep quiet, but from our friends who are eager to, sol eager to solve the problem. Our norms are our norms. They may evolve over time to accommodate the modern context, but their essence should be stable, and we should not sacrifice them for short-term gain. Over the next couple of years, each of us as individuals may need the collective us as a community more than ever. There may be more attacks, there may be more mistakes. But the worst outcome would be if we let this divide us as individuals and at the same time separate us from the very special norms, principles, and values which as scientists we all share. Now let me channel Steve's advice. I asked his wife and colleague Terry Root um, what Steve would have advised if he were giving this speech. And this is what she told me. And if you slept through the last 45 minutes, for which I wouldn't blame you, uh, you can pay attention to this and get the gist of it. This is what Steve would have said. The truth is bad enough. Integrity should never be compromised. Don't be afraid to use metaphors. Distinguish when speaking about your values as a member of the human race and when speaking as a scientist. And don't let fear from deniers keep you from working on the most important problems facing society. Let me end with the way Steve ended many of his emails after relating one of his own experiences with the public arena and policymakers, a a, it just a beautiful combination of exasperation and hope. Thank you. So now we're going to have uh, the panel discussion whereby the audience uh, uh, is welcome to ask questions of uh, the bestsellers panel from this morning, plus questions to Michael. Before, while they're coming up here, though, I want to present Michael with a, uh, a special certificate that we AGU helped us put together, where the Global Environmental Change Focus Group recognizes Michael Oppenheimer for giving the, t the 2010 Stephen Schneider 
Global Environmental Change Lecture, and we greatly appreciate him doing so. Oh, we need a picture. Where's the best place? We need the, we need the whole thing. Okay, would the authors from this morning please come up to the stage? So if you have a question for any of our speakers from this morning or, or Michael from this afternoon, uh, there are microphones. I know there's one here, and I guess there's one back there. I can't see anything because there's bright light shining at me. But uh, um, I don't know if there's others on the sides or not. It must, might be just these two. Um, we'll uh, go by, one by one. We'll take turns between the two mics. Um, and. Uh, uh, you know, just line up and we'll get started. Do we have everybody up here? I think so. No, we don't have uh, Wally Broker, do we? We don't have Jim Hansen. Okay, I think Jim Hansen's on his way back. So we'll, we'll get started and uh, perhaps a couple of our other speakers will still show up. Um, so do you want to start, please? Hi, uh, this is a question for the panel. Uh, Dr. Oppenheimer has already kindly answered it. Uh, earlier this year, Dr. Oppenheimer published a study on drought in the Southwest, um, declining crop yields in Mexico, and the possibility that this would drive uh, population toward north into the U.S. Um, he was criticized for this by Roger Pilka, Jr. and some others, um, calling it uh, silly science. Um, so my question for the panel is, does the premise uh, make sense to you, basically? And is this a worthy study of, uh, wor worthy of study? I don't expect you could have read the, the study. Uh, certainly. Uh, earlier this year, uh, Dr. Oppenheimer published a study um, looking at um, the prospect for drought in the southwest this century, the likelihood that drought will reduce crop yields in Mexico and drive population north. For this study, he was criticized by Roger Pilka, Jr. and some others uh, who called it silly science. and. So my question is not about the study specifically, but about the premise. Does this premise make sense to you? And B, is this a topic worthy of study? I'll let others certainly add to this, but I'm, I might jump in here. Um, in 2009, um, 33 scientists that were selected by President Bush to be, to, uh, synthesize our understanding of climate, potential climate impacts on the United States, published a report that, uh, out of the White House basically, and published by USGCRP, that basically comes to those same conclusions based on, on our understanding of the literature. So I don't think it's, uh, you know, it's not just Michael that's saying that. I think it's many of us in the community that have looked in detail at the existing uh, climate modeling results, both uh, from regional scale and from downscaling of global model results, uh, that that it appears that those may be real issues. Ted. Uh, as I understand the question, it's really about how is it appropriate to speak about speculative risks using argumentation and analysis that is nevertheless founded, although not completely determined by scientific knowledge. and. 
it seems to me it's, it's difficult to find a way to speak responsibly about such matters. On the other hand, shutting up about them doesn't sound like the right answer either. In, in a sense, the criticism that you attribute to Pilkey is really a kind of an obvious cheap shot, the implications of which would be don't speak about a risk until it is confidently and authoritatively established. And as I suggested in my remarks earlier in the panel this morning uh, about Andy's and, and my book, this might be the right answer in speaking within the terms of scientific discourse and arguing about kind of novel propositions that purport to overturn understanding, but it's really not the right way to weigh the risks of different kinds of errors when you're speaking about risk management decisions. It seems to me in all domains of public policy, we make decisions based upon speculative risks, some of which are judged to be rather small. The essence of a responsible uh, response has to be about clarity, about the limitations of the evidence, and where you are putting together possibilities based upon existing evidence and argument. Yes. Um, I'll speak to that, though I'm not qualified as a scientist. I'm the opposite of a high school teacher. Um, and for those of you who caught my talk earlier, I'm, Actually, I'm better now. Opposite. I was kind of rather maniacally that I went over the top of that wall with gusto. Um, I, the one thing I do claim expertise on is what middle America thinks about it and an analysis of the contrarian talking points. Um, as to what the American public thinks about the premise, they think it's not just silly, it's ludicrous, it's alarmist. As to whether it's worth um, considering and what to do about that, um, I'm a big believer in knowing your role, where your authority is, and where your speculation is. The, uh, one of the, our big problems in communication is the public thinks they need to understand it, but they're not qualified to understand the science. You are. Um, so we need to make that distinction. Um, you are not qualified to do risk assessment. You are qualified to provide the input for that. You know exactly how to do errors and percentages and probabilities. The ones who are qualified to do risk assessment, because it's their job, is um, the national military establishment and the national intelligence establishment. And in my book, I've got, I, I dug up some reports that are just absolutely stunning from them, from, from the naval think tank, um, from a summary assessment of 17 different national intelligence agencies, from a Pentagon report, et cetera. Um, the most terrifying one for me was the one produced by a panel of eight or nine generals. The, the most junior guy was a lieutenant general on the panel. Must have sucked for him when people said, hey, kid, go out and get us some coffee. Um, their conclusion, they did it in three scenarios. And I specialize in worst case scenarios. What's the worst that could happen? I couldn't read their third scenario because it was, uh, I, I couldn't take it in my gut. And one of them, not as part of the report, but as a preface saying we had interesting and productive discussions, noted that in the discussion, in the discussions, the, Mad, the movie Mad Max came up. They are the ones who are qualified to do the risk assessment. What you can do is put on your citizen hat, take their assessment, and say, as a scientist, here's my understanding of the data. I gave that to the risk assessment exper experts. Um, and as a citizen and a father and a mother, uh, here are my hopes, here are my fears, and here's my plan B for my family. So I think, uh, if you missed my talk earlier, I think the most powerful thing you can do in, in changing the divergence between scientific and public opinion is to be willing to take off your scientist hat and explicitly wear your citizen hat and share your heart with the audience because we don't make decisions rationally, we make them emotionally, and that's how you get change. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Back Thanks. <clears throat> uh, I read this on, uh, I think, Andy Revkin's blog today or yesterday, and the question is, should there be more Republicans who are scientists? And if there should, how, how do we do that? Because the Republicans turn away early in the, uh, in the education process in universities and go into other fields. And should they be scientists? Okay, I'll, I'll take that one on because I spoke to it this morning. So, um, Revkin was responding in part to something that Dan Sarowitz said in Slate last week or the week before. And actually my co-author, Eric Conway, has written a reply to that. The Republican Party has been on a collision course with science since the 1980s. They have consistently taken positions that put them at odds with the scientific evidence. And I think that that has to be confronted. And I think that to blame scientists for not being Republicans is to put the causal arrow in the entirely wrong direction. Anything else? Well, well there's a, before you speak, let me 
We got Andy Dessler and, and Wally Broker sitting in the audience who actually should be up here. If we can get them up here, we'd like to. 